In this video, we continue the new approach to the Highland bagpipe scale, including crosses where we lift and lower our fingers at the same time to make note changes. Stay tuned. Well, hello everybody, I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper, and on this channel, I make videos to make you a stronger and more confident piper. If you like this kind of content, please, like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment below with any thoughts you have, and share with any pipers that you think might get something out of it. I also give Skype lessons for those that want more personalized instruction, but more on that later. In the description below, there are links to PDF downloads of the material that I'll be using today. In editing this video, it ended up being a lot longer than I anticipated, so it ended up being two videos. You can see part one in a card right here, where we deal with just either lifting or lowering our fingers to start the basic scale in a simple, methodical way. In this video, we're going to be dealing with crosses where one finger is having to come up while another finger is coming down, and that's quite a bit more complicated. As we go through the video, you'll see music on the stand that's not going to quite match what you're seeing in these PDF downloads. I was able to come up with better, more intuitive sheets that I think will help people a lot more. So it doesn't quite look the same, but the notes I'm playing and the instruction I give is the same, just the sheets themselves look a bit different. As I'm going through the exercises on this video, you'll see I'm using a metronome. If you're just starting, however, I don't recommend a metronome right off the bat. I recommend figuring out how to make all of these note changes cleanly, accurately, using all the tips I give, and only once you can do that at a slow, controlled pace would I add a metronome to try to get it in a specific rhythm. But right now, cleanliness of finger work is the most important thing. So a cross is where we have to lift one finger and then lower another. And I've, for 20 years now, called it the golden rule of bagpiping, that we want to lift before we lower. In the real world, what we're really looking for is that both fingers are moving at the same time. So we're going to start right here with the crosses with low A. And you can see we're starting with low A, going up to a C, and then back to a low A. So on low A, we're here, but a C is here. Well, there's a number of problems that can let easily creep in there. So you're on low A. If you lower this first, what's happening? That's a low G. You're going to go low A, G, C. We don't want that at all. Yuck. So how do you get around it? You want to make sure that as this is lowering, these are lifting. It should be like a pair of scissors. They should be moving at the same time. You can see that there's a point in time and space where none of the fingers that are moving are on. Both these fingers have come up, and yet the pinky hasn't quite made its way back down. Now it's in slow motion. You're trying to make this as close to having a noise. You're almost wanting to hear that low G. It's like right as that's about to touch, you want those coming up. But we don't want to hear that low G. And one of the reasons we don't want to hear that low G is the nature of the channer. Now a practice channer is a uh, nice tool that allows us to learn the basic fingering, but it doesn't have the volume balance of a set of Highland pipes. On a set of Highland pipes, low G is really loud. And high A is relatively quiet, to be honest. I know it's still pipes and they're all loud. But the lowest note, low G, is much louder. And as you go up the scale, every successive note up gets quieter. So if you're on A, which is the second loudest note, going to C, which is like the fifth loudest note or fourth loudest note, but you get that low G in there, you're going to play the loudest note for just a split second between the two, and it's going to pop out. Many of our future embellishments, grips, tarluas, throws, they actually use the power of that low G and the volume of that low G to really create an impact in the music. But we want to be able to dial in exactly where that happens, and we don't want it to be in a crossing noise. So again, we're going to start on low A, and we want to make sure that I actually think about moving that middle finger first, that this comes up and that comes down. Yeah, I know. It's a lot to think about. These are coming up, that's coming down. This guy's got to lead the charge, because if this one lifts first, you're going to hear a B. That's not good. And in fact, you can have a run and a cross at the same time. They are not exclusive to each other. You could still... Yuck. That's terrible. We don't want that at all. What am I doing? I'm lowering my pinky first and then still lifting this and then that. That's like in every way bad. We want to be on low A. Make sure the middle finger is initiating the motion. Ring finger is coming with it. Pinky down. And then on the way back down, you want to make sure that as these are lowering, the pinky has come up before these have made contact with the channer, or you're going to hear with that low G in there. And again, we want to be able to control when that happens, and that's not very controlled right there. 
And then the same thing, we're going to move on to D. And again, I'm using a little bit of radial motion in my wrist. Uh, there's just, it's not a lot. I'm not, I'm not turning 90 degrees. It's like 10. But there is a little bit of motion in my wrist and it really helps keep those fingers moving the way I need to and keeping my fingers super clean. I saw a YouTube of Gordon Duncan, rest his soul, playing uh, and it, it kind of blew my mind because I actually saw him doing kind of what I'm talking about. I had really tried to isolate my motion in my fingers. I was being limited. And to see a player of his immense talent and, and just amazing playing um, have some small but noticeable uh, motion in his wrist to make his finger movements so clean really kind of lit a light bulb in my head about how to approach not just my own playing, but how I could go about teaching others to play it. All right, so let's give this a try. Crosses with low A. That's all the crosses with low A. The reason for that is all of the top hand notes already have your bottom hand in that A position. So that's all we got for low A. Let's move on to crosses with B. Crosses with B. They can be a little bit tricky. There are quite a few. There's six bars here of music. Let's talk about it. So we have B to C. Now this one's not the end of the world if this comes down first because you're not going to really hear a cross. There's a noise, but it's pretty slight. But we still want to make sure that we're lifting before we lower. I kind of think about B to C like a seesaw around my ring finger if you watch what my fingers are doing. So I'm on B, lifting and then lowering, lifting then lowering. Whether I'm going up or down, I'm still lifting before I lower. So there's B to C. And then we have B to D, and there's a moment right there. I'm pivoting my wrist again. Let's see if I can get that on camera. And I'm kind of bringing my pinky down more because I'm slightly, again, by about 10 degrees. It's not huge. I'm slightly pivoting my wrist to bring that pinky down because I really want to make sure that pointer finger is leading the way because I don't want to hear a run. Yuck. Notice my D looks like that when I'm done. Not like this. That. If your D doesn't look like that, it's probably messy. Then we have B to E. The exchanging of the ring fingers. Again, if you lower this first, that one ring finger, you're going to hear the low A. Don't do that. Make sure that this is lifted before that comes down. Then we have B to F. Make sure that middle finger is leading the way or you're going to hear the run through the E. But you could also still have a cross to the A. Mm. We definitely don't want that. We want B to high G. Same thing. We have to involve that finger. We don't want the low A cross. And then we want to, again, we don't have, because of the thumb position and the fact that we're going to be engaging a bag with that arm, we don't have as much uh, ability to necessarily twist or rotate this wrist, but we still want our hand in a position that's kind of slightly staggered. Again, I don't, I'm not trying to wave high to my neighbor. Try to keep my fingers relatively close to the channel, but they're not evenly off. The ring finger's closest, and I like to have my pinky float. This would probably be easier if my pinky was down, but it doesn't work that way for me. Ring finger, middle finger, pointer finger. And then B to high A. Again, make sure you don't have that cross to low A by lowering that early. The ring finger's gonna stay down this time, but you wanna start this motion with your thumb. The thumb is the finger that's going to initiate the sound of that high A. So as long as that thumb moves first, you're not going to have a run to that high A. Let's give it a go. Those are all the crosses with B. Crosses with C. This gets quite a bit more complicated in many ways because the pinky's down and every time we're gonna need to be having our hand do something that involves that pinky lifting because, well, except for D, every other note from C does not have the pinky down. The only notes with the pinky down are C and D. And D isn't in this. We've already worked on that one in the exercise above. So we go C down to A and up. We dealt with that with crosses with A. 
there's some overlap in here. I wanted each line to contain every possible cross that occurs with that note. And because of that, some of them are overlapped. But if you know you're having problems with your crosses on C, I want you to be able to have one line that had everything spelled out for you. So CAC and BCB, the first two bars, have both been worked through above. So let's go straight to CEC. So here, lots of things are going on. We're going to want to make sure that that top ring finger is initiating the motion because that's the note that's sounding the E. But I want to make sure that my pinky's coming up at the same time. I want both this guy and that guy to be moving before these are coming down so we don't hear a low G or a low A or anything funny or fuzzy or that. We don't have... Yuck. But if you're too slow bringing these down, These make a noise too, so these switches need to be pretty exact. There's not a lot of extra time to do them, and that's challenging. But if I have to air in a direction, I'd rather have it be slightly too open than slightly too closed, because is way less distracting than like going down to a low G. That's going to like just bang itself out, and everyone's going to hear it. And then C to F. Every time we make a note change, the closer the finger is to your face, the, the sooner it has to come off as we're making a note change up. It's just the nature of how it works, because otherwise, again, you're going to have a run. So when we're going C to F, we don't want to hear an E. And we don't want to cross either. There's a lot of extra ugly noises that can happen from C to F. We want nice and clean, lifting before you lower, middle finger leading the way. It's challenging. This line alone might take you an hour or two to sort out or more, but it's worth your time. There's only nine notes in the traditional Highland bagpipe scale. If it takes you a few hours to sort it out, it's fine because you're hopefully going to have hundreds of dozens or more hours of enjoyment on this lovely instrument we're learning. But let's make sure we're doing it right to start with and not letting messy things, messy fingering, get in the way of a good solid foundation. C to high G. Again, no crosses on the bottom hand and make sure that that pointer finger is coming up so we don't get a run. And then B to high A, making sure the thumb comes off first. I could talk specifically about every change, but you're going to find they start, a lot of the things we're trying to fix are very similar. There's maybe an extra nuance or two, but I want to make sure this video isn't like two hours long. Let's go ahead and just dive in, play it. You can watch my fingers, listen to that there's nothing extra going on, and do your best to emulate it. And again, for the beginner that's using this perhaps as a, a, a learning method, don't worry about a metronome. Just play it. Make it slow. Pay attention to your fingers. And also, don't feel bad looking down at your fingers right now. I know it's counterintuitive, and eventually I don't want you staring at your fingers. But right now, looking at your fingers and making sure that you see the correct angle on your hands as you're moving them can go a long way to making sure that you're playing the instrument correctly. For the remainder of the video, I'm going to kind of just play through. If I find something that I particularly need to talk about, I will. But again, you want to make sure that you're lifting before you lower when you're making these note changes, whether you're going up to a note or down to a note. If you lower first, you're likely to have a cross, which is where you hear the low note between them. Secondly, you want to make sure that the finger that's lifting, that's closest to your face, is kind of leading the charge on the way up. And on the way down, the finger that's furthest from you is kind of leading the way. Because we want to make sure that as we're going up, we're leading here, up with that middle finger. But on the way down, this guy's got to be the last down. If it's the first down, you're going to hear a big old brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
when to move them. It's going to help, but this takes a lot of time. Um, it's not unusual for my beginning students to spend two or even three lessons on just changing notes. I don't rush through this. I used to, and it was not good. This quite literally is the foundation we're building our music on. If this foundation isn't solid, then the music you're going to play isn't solid. So take your time. It's not a race. It should be enjoyable, but I'm not going to lie. This part can be a little bit frustrating. So we're going to go crosses with D. So crosses with D. Remember, there's going to be a lot of that kind of radial motion to make sure that that pointer finger is getting both up and down. It's both the lifting and the lowering it. That, that radial motion helps with both of those things. I'm going to go ahead and just start the metronome and play the crosses with D line. Crosses with E. When you're going to the top hand, that you're getting your bottom hand into that three down, one up position every time. Uh, it's really easy as you, you might be on it like C to an F, but you, this on a practice channel sounds fine. I promise you on a set of pipes, it does not sound fine. This is the only way it's in tune. This sounds wonky, but on a practice channel, it, it's almost indistinguishable, but it's not going to work very well. So you just have to be very mindful about what your fingers are doing as we do these crosses. As you do the top hand notes, every time you go to that top hand note, be very mindful. Maybe use a mirror. I think mirrors can be very useful. Just a small little mirror you can prop up and literally look at your own fingers with to make sure that as you go to that every top hand note that you see that bottom hand, boom, looking right like that for E, F, G, high A. None of this weird, not correctly fingered stuff. Crosses with E. And on that very final one, high A to E to high A, you can have a big cross to low A on that. If you don't get this finger out of the way. So if you hear that little clunky noise, you know that your ring finger is not moving at the right time. So watch out for that. Crosses with F. Again, make sure it's clean. Don't just race to get to the end of this. The goal isn't getting through it. The goal is that it's clean and accurate. So just getting through this fast so you can get to the next lesson is not going to help you. Get it right. Get it clean. I promise you, a solid foundation is worth all of it because you don't want to rebuild this in six months or two years or four years from now. Get it right now. In editing the video, I see I actually didn't play the high A crossing line, so we're going to do that right now. For these crosses, we've actually already worked through each one of these in the separate lines. When we did B, when we did C, when we did D, and when we just did high G a minute ago. So we've already kind of talked about all these changes, but I did want a specific line if you wanted to focus on your high A crosses in particular. So after all of that, we can finally play what people would think is a basic normal scale, the one that you would normally start with, where you just go one note at a time. People want to start here, but I don't think it's the best place to start. This is kind of a reward. You finally get to hear the scale after doing all this other work. So thank you for sticking along so far. Now let's play this basic scale. <laughs> And there you go. That is a new approach to the basic scales. It's a little bit longer. There's a couple extra pages. There's a few more steps, but I think it's going to help pipers in general build a stronger foundation to create the music that we want to make on this instrument. There will be more scalic 
exercises in future videos. I'll have, again have a link when they're ready. Um, there's a lot of things we can do and a lot of rhythms we can apply to the things we just did that can really help us, but it's beyond the scope of this already probably too long video. So be looking out for those. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate you watching this video. I hope you got something out of it. And if you did, please like the video, comment below with your thoughts. Again, if you're an instructor, by all means, use it for your own instruction. And if you do, let me know how it works for you. If this works better than the regular method or if the regular method works better for you. Um, I'm always trying new things. I wanna make sure that we're, we're really kind of pushing the envelope, if you will, on, on how we're approaching the music. Just because it's been done one way for a long time doesn't mean it's the best way. And there's only so many minutes in this life. I wanna make sure we're using them as best we can. If you wanna go the extra mile, head over to my Patreon. There's some advanced viewings of many of my videos and a bit of exclusive content here and there. I'm gonna to try to work on that even more than I have. But the Patreon supporters and contributors I have go a long way to helping build this channel into what it is. And I thank you guys so very much. So please join that community. If you want more personalized lessons, I do give Skype lessons. So please contact me at www.mattpiper.com or the email that's linked below and get in touch with me. I'd love to work with you and make you a stronger and more confident bagpiper. Until next time, everybody, I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper and uh, cheers. <laughs>